Hi everyone, welcome to a new video about the listening test. Thank you very much for trusting me to help you learn and master English. Please keep listening and focusing on these tests to train your brain to understand the English language. This is very important for you. Don't forget to subscribe to be able to receive all the updates about this channel. I wish you the best of luck in your listening test. Test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. Complete the notes about two people who work at ESCO Engineering. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Listen and complete the notes about two people who work at ESCO Engineering. Oh, hi Maggie, it's Greg. Hi Greg. I'm phoning to check some information about some of the staff. I'm putting all the staff data into new files and I noticed that I don't have files for two people. I think you might have them. Oh really? What are their names? Peter Austin and Jane Moore. Let me have a look. Yes. I've got them here. Shall I send them to you? No, you don't need to. Just give me the information now. I can write it on some new files. I don't really need the photos if you've got photos there. OK. Well, Peter Austin first. Now, is that Austin with an I or Austin with an E? It's A-U-S-T-I-N and his address is 110 Argyle Street, Tunbridge Wells, Kent, tn 3 5RQ. 110? Uh-huh. And his phone number? It's 07984 645 792. OK. And how old is he? He's 47. 47. And what about his marital status? He's married. There's a note here that he has three children, two boys and a girl. OK. And finally, when did he join the company? He started with ESCO in August 2003. Thanks, Maggie. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, what about Jane? Her name's Jane Moore, that's M-O-O-R-E, and her address is 72 Cedar Road, Crowborough, Kent, CR3 5RQ. CR3 and what, sorry? CR3 5RQ. And how do you spell Cedar? C-E-D-A-R. Her phone number is 07984 650 396. 07984 650 396. Yes. Now, she's 22 and she's single. OK. And she started with ESCO in 2005, February 2005. Right. Thanks, Maggie. That's very helpful. <laughs> Goodbye now. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a tour guide talking to a group of visitors about Bestley Castle. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to Besley Castle. It's nice to see so many of you here today. Before we go in, I'd like to tell you some information about the castle, the things to see and do, and the facilities available to you in the grounds. We'll do our best to make this a truly memorable visit. Now, the castle grounds are quite big, and we don't want you to get lost so I'm going to give you an idea of the layout. At the moment, we are at the entrance, and immediately to our left is the tourist information office. Go here if you need any questions answered. They'll be happy to help. And of course, behind the tourist office is the car park where the coach dropped you off, and it'll also pick you up from the same spot at 5 p.m. today. In front of us are the water gardens, if you stroll through, you get to the North Bridge, which is the entrance to Besley Castle. Take your time and enjoy looking around the castle. There is a lot of history steeped in those walls. As you leave the castle via the South Bridge, you'll be greeted with the sight of roaming deer. During the day, there will be scheduled feeding opportunities where visitors can get involved. However, we do request that you do not feed the deer outside these times. To the right of the deer park is the Castle Museum, and behind that is our award-winning restaurant. It's a relatively new addition to the castle grounds, but is fast gaining a reputation for its food. Alternatively, you can choose to dine in the picnic area on the other side of the deer park. It's perfect for the family as it's next to the kids' play area and homemade ice cream hut. We hope that on your way out, you pop into the gift shop by the exit for something to remember us by. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Admission to the grounds is free for all. That includes the museum, gardens and picnic area. There is an admission fee for the castle, which is £6.50 for adults, with a 10% discount for students and retired people. Children under the age of 16 pay half adult price and under 8 go in free. There are many spectacular events throughout the year, and for most of them, there's also an admission fee. As these events are in high demand, it's a good idea to book well in advance. Some of the exciting events planned for this year are the Summer Medieval Festival, where you can watch old-fashioned nights and experience a feast in the halls of the castle, as if you were a guest of King Henry VIII himself. There are several concerts planned this year, too, including a rock concert at an admission price of £10 per person and a special jazz concert, which is free to the public. I'm sure you'll agree that all tastes and ages will be satisfied. One scary but extremely popular event is the annual Haunted Castle event at the end of October, where the castle comes alive at night. Why don't you come along if you're brave enough? Another sight to see is the fantastic firework display on November 5th, and the cost of that includes refreshments. We also have a long tradition of raising money for charity. 
The charity event held every year on the first day of May. Will this year be an archery contest? Entrance is free, but donations are certainly welcome. This year, we'll be collecting money on behalf of a charity for elderly people. Age concern. Just in case you can't remember all of that, you can pick up a leaflet showing the timetable and prices for all events from the tourist information desk. You can also go online to get this information from our website. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear somebody talking to a group of students about a university language centre. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, I'm Katie Shaw and I work at the University Language Centre. Your tutor tells me you might be interested in using the centre, so I'm here at the college to explain a bit about it and, of course, to answer your questions. Where exactly is the centre? Is it near the college? It's actually on King's Road, just round the corner from here, in fact. Oh, I know it, yes. I wondered what that building was. Yes. What's there? Well, the library has about 4,000 books, pamphlets and transcripts to go with some of the 12,500 items on audio or video cassettes. These are at a wide range of levels of difficulty, covering language learning material in over 100 languages. There are also reference books without tapes, including dictionaries, grammars, grammar workbooks, vocabulary workbooks and model letters as well as texts on academic writing and effective study habits, etc. Audio cassette workrooms are on the first floor, by the way. Do they get any foreign language press there too? Yes. The library subscribes to a number of European daily and weekly newspapers, including Le Monde from France, L'Espresso from Italy, and the weekly international edition of the Spanish paper El País. What about learning with computers? Can you do that there? Call, or computer-aided language learning, is available on the first floor. Um, how many PCs are there? Counting both Macintosh and PC platforms, there are nine at present. There are materials in over 15 different languages, and new material and language categories are being added as library funds permit. The programmes cover verb drills, uh, grammar exercises, activities to accompany multimedia textbooks, pronunciation, translation, and some multimedia applications. The same hardware permits access to the internet with its many language learning and discussion sites. What about TV? That's a good way of learning a language too. Yes, definitely. We agree. So on the second floor of the centre, there are televisions to view live satellite television broadcasts in seven languages. Oh. Which ones are they? Currently, we've got Arabic, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish and Russian. Turkish broadcasting can be viewed live on request. The centre records the news in French, German, Arabic, Italian, Japanese, Spanish and Russian. And English too. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Sounds great. How do we sign up? To avoid paying a fee, you need to go to the centre with a valid university ID card or a letter from your college or departmental administrator on headed paper indicating your status, length of stay and language requirements. Are there any forms to fill in? I'm afraid so. Mm. You do that at the ground floor reception desk. Your registration is for one academic year only and needs to be renewed annually. You should tell the librarian who you are on your first visit and you will need to take part in an induction to the library service, including the proper operation of the centre's computers, televisions, videos and so on. Can she help us choose the right materials too? Yes. The librarian can give advice and assistance in locating material, making best use of the texts and tapes and so on. Let her know which language you want to study and what, if any, knowledge of it you already have. Also, say what reasons you have for learning the language. Your answers will help the librarian help you make the best choice of books and tapes for your needs. She can also offer you advice on how much time is needed to make progress in the language and can offer suggestions on how to improve your language learning techniques. Can she copy tapes for us to take home or can we borrow them? The library is a resource centre and reference library only. You can do as much self-study listening and reading work there as you want, but it's not possible to take home materials, that's to say books or cassettes. And copyright law doesn't permit the library or its staff to make copies of cassettes for use by students outside the centre. All material must be used on the premises, I'm afraid. This ensures the materials are always available for students working on their own and not out on loan for long periods, which could harm users' progress. So, if we can't take books home, is it OK to photocopy them? The library staff will handle any photocopying. Though international copyright law prohibits users from copying more than 5% of any one title in the academic year. You place a photocopy order with the librarian or an assistant and orders will be processed between 1 and 2 o'clock or after 5.30. How much does it cost? 10 pence per page. Payment is by photocopy card, which you can buy from the information desk on the ground floor. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on seasonal affective disorder. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In the past few years, a new condition has been identified and given a name, SAD, short for Seasonal Affective Disorder. This is now recognised as a distinct kind of clinical depression, where people become depressed at the onset of winter, accompanied by a craving for sweet things, causing weight gain. Each spring and summer would then bring on almost maniacal highs and feelings of boundless energy and happiness. Experiments to combat this depression showed that increased exposure to bright light in humans could suppress their production of a darkness-related hormone called melatonin. The light needed to induce this change was about 2,000 lux, or about four times brighter than ordinary household lighting. It was then calculated that if bright light could suppress melatonin secretion, then it might have other effects on the brain, 
including the reversal of symptoms of depression. While melatonin's precise role in SAD has not been pinned down, the theory led to effective treatment. Not surprisingly, SAD affects more people where winter nights are longer and days shorter. In the UK, an estimated half a million adults develop a full-blown SAD in winter, and twice this number suffer the milder condition called sub-syndromal SAD. About 80% of sufferers improve when given light therapy, and improvement usually comes within two to four days. Scientists are still unsure why winter depression happens, but more than a decade of research has turned up some surprising findings. Nearly 80% of SAD victims are women. Researchers are uncertain why this is so. SAD can affect people at any age, but typically it begins around the age of 20 and becomes less common between 40 and 50. SAD is comparatively rare in children and adolescents. But so far, researchers have been unable to come up with a logical reason for this. As many as half of sad sufferers have at least one family member with depressive illness, suggesting that the depression has a genetic component. Some patients experience shifts in their body clocks when they're depressed in winter. They are morning people at one time of the year, and become evening people at another. What is the underlying difference between sad sufferers and others? A clue can be found in carbohydrate craving, a common symptom. People often become obsessed with chocolate, for example. Carbohydrates alter brain chemistry by increasing the level of a soothing chemical called serotonin, a neurotransmitter that carries signals between brain cells. Sad sufferers crave carbohydrates because they may need serotonin to lift their mood. This craving can be intense. In fact, an addiction. It may be that the serotonin system of the brain has problems regulating itself during the winter. Some sad sufferers respond well to the drug Prozac, thought to influence the brain's serotonin-using system. Other brain chemicals and hormones probably play a role in winter depression. Another neurotransmitter, dopamine, for example. May be inadequate in certain cases. Researchers hope to uncover clues to sad secret by probing similarities between sad and hibernation. Though no valid link between the two has been established, some sad patients say they feel like hibernating animals. Sad sufferers tend to put on fat in autumn and early winter, roughly the time when such hibernators as bears and squirrels do. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Part 1. You will hear a woman phoning an electrical repair company about a problem with a piece of household equipment. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, Sinclair Electrical Services, Kevin speaking. Oh, good morning. Um, I believe you do television repairs. That's right, we do. Well, my television's not working, but I don't have a car. Can you come round to see it? That shouldn't be a problem. Good. <laughs> Can I just take a few details, then? Certainly. So, if I could start with your name? Yes, it's Mrs Douglas. D-O-U-G-L-A-S? It's double S at the end, actually. OK. And the address? 135 Park Hill Avenue. In Somerton? That's right. And would you like my phone number? Yes, please. It's 765... 482. 428? Two. Two, eight. No, 82. OK, right. So, what's the problem with the television? Um, low volume. Even when you turn it up to maximum, it doesn't seem to make much difference. I mean, it's quite an old TV, but it's always worked perfectly well up to now. And the picture's OK. Mm. I, I did wonder. We had a power cut a couple of days ago, and it's not been right since then. I don't know if that could have affected it. It certainly might have something to do with it. Anyway, I'll come over and have a look. Uh, can you tell me the make and model number by any chance? The number will be on the back of the TV. Mm, um, yes, it's uh, Schneider. That's S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R. And the model number's... Um, let me see. Yes, it's s double v five. Double O two. Right. Is that a fairly recent model? Mm, not really. I got it seven years ago. I remember the date because it was the year after I moved into this house and that was eight years ago. I hope you can fix it. I really don't want to buy another one. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Well, I'll see what I can do when I come round to the house to look at it. I think I know your road. Is it the one that's off the high street? That's right. The house is on the left if you're coming from the high street, just before the road bends to the right. I'm afraid it's getting harder and harder to park on the road, but if you drive on round the bend, you can usually find somewhere. That's all right. Now, let's see. When would it be convenient for me to come round? Well, as soon as possible, really. Well, what's today? Friday. I'm booked up today, and then we've got the weekend, so I'm afraid it looks like Monday morning's the earliest. You can't come tomorrow? Well, Saturday morning I'm in the showroom, and I don't work Saturday afternoon and Sunday. OK. I'll make sure I'm in. Oh, and one last thing. I wonder if you'd mind telling me how you heard about us. We've just opened a new web page, and we're interested to see how effective it is. No, I actually heard about you from the woman next door. She couldn't remember your number, but I looked it up in the phone book. Oh, right. It's always the best advertising, word of mouth. Right. OK. Thank you, Mrs Douglas. Thank you. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide speaking to a group of tourists who are visiting a part of New Zealand called Rotorua. You will hear part of a radio program about online exchange business. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello everyone, and I'd like to welcome you all to Rotorua, one of the most famous destinations in New Zealand, where we have a long history of welcoming visitors. I'd like to explain a bit about the geography of this amazing region, famous for its geothermal activity, and tell you what we've planned for your stay. Well, if you'd like to have a look at the map of the region that's in your welcome pack, if you find Lake Rotorua on the top left, the big triangular lake, we've just driven down along State Highway 5, SH5, down the western side of the lake, and then we turned off through the town. And we're here at the Lakes Motel, just around the southern tip of the lake. OK? Now tomorrow, we'll be heading off along SH30 in the opposite direction from the town, towards Lake Rotoita, where we'll be visiting the Hell's Gate Thermal Reserve. This is the area between the SH30 road and the lake, and I'll be telling you more about this in a minute. We'll then be returning to the motel, and in the afternoon, we'll be visiting the town of Rotorua itself, and also the Arts and Crafts Institute, which is just along the SH30 from the motel, where it meets the SH5 outside the town. Now, if you look directly out of the motel towards the southeast, in the opposite direction to Lake Rotorua, you can just see the peak of Mount Tarawera, and the day after tomorrow, we'll be visiting the volcanic valley which was formed when this last erupted. We'll drive down the SH5 and then head off towards Lake Rotamahana. The valley's on the opposite side of the lake from the mountain, so you can see what a powerful effect the eruption had. There's also an interesting archaeological site, a village buried by the same eruption on the western shores of Lake Tarawera, just to the north but I'm afraid we won't have time to visit that as a group, although you may wish to go there on your own. However, on the way back towards Rotorua along the SH5, we'll be stopping at Tamaki Village, which is on the main road about 12 kilometres outside town. Before you hear the rest of the programme, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So now let me tell you a bit more about these attractions. Just driving past the lake and through the town, I'm sure you've realised this is somewhere quite different from anywhere else in the world. So tomorrow, we'll start by visiting Hell's Gate Thermal Reserve. This is the most active area of the region volcanically and you'll see New Zealand's largest boiling whirlpool, where the water is actually 100 degrees centigrade, together with the largest hot waterfall in the Southern Hemisphere, where it's a more comfortable 40 degrees centigrade, just right for a hot shower. Entry is just $12 for adults and $6 for children. We'll come back to the motel for lunch, after which we'll visit the Arts and Crafts Institute, where you can learn about Maori people who lived here before the Europeans came. There's a display of Maori carving, showing this traditional skill at its most impressive, and exhibitions where you can learn about the use of geothermal waters for cooking food and for medicinal purposes. Entry is free and you'll find plenty to do there for the whole afternoon. The following day we'll be visiting another highlight of the region, the Volcanic Valley. This is a very new part of New Zealand. The valley was formed less than 150 years ago in 1886 when Mount Tarawera erupted violently, completely destroying the beautiful pink and white terraces that used to attract tourists to the region. 
After lunch, you can take a boat trip to see the volcanic activity at the edge of the lake. That's $25 for adults and $5 for children. We'll then be spending the afternoon learning more about traditional Maori life and pre-European New Zealand at Tamaki Village. As you walk around this recreated village, your Maori guide will tell you more about this traditional culture. And as the sun sets, you can enjoy a traditionally cooked feast known as the hangi. That's H-A-N-G-I consisting of meat and vegetables cooked over hot stones, which are placed in a hole in the ground and covered with earth. And there's no extra charge for this. It's all included in the basic cost of your holiday. Now, does anyone have any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will now hear a radio talk on agricultural regulations. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Could there be clearer proof of the arrogance and indifference of those who are supposed to keep our food safe than the muzzling of John Verrill? Agriculture is a business, true, and businesses have to make money. But this shows how ministers and officials put the profits of the agriculture business before the well-being of the British people. Mr. Verrill a pharmaceutical chemist, was appointed to represent consumers on one of the many committees that advise the government on food safety. When he tried to do his job, though, and wanted to warn ministers of a danger to children's health, he was refused permission to do so. The danger comes from hormones given to cattle in the USA and some other countries to make them grow faster. They speed up the animal's development to maturity, thus making meat production more profitable. There have, however, long been fears that the hormones have horrendous effects on the people who eat them, causing diseases as serious as cancer. Once these hormones were used on British cattle too, but over 20 years ago they were banned in Europe for being too dangerous. Indeed, so concerned is the European Union that it banned imports of hormone-fed beef years ago, much to the fury of the US government, which wants to sell it all over the world. Several years ago, the USA and Canada asked the World Trade Organization to declare the ban illegal and to punish Europe for failing to lift it. The WTO, with its long record of refusing to let environmental or safety concerns interfere with trade, agreed imposing fines of more than $120 million a year on the EU for its refusal to back down. The British government now backs the Americans, claiming that there is no proof that hormone-fed beef does any harm. This is where Mr Verrill comes in. He is very angry with the government, especially as their claim comes out just after a Danish study shows that growth hormones are 200 times more dangerous than was previously thought. Worried by these findings, Mr Verrill spoke to government representatives, who did nothing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Not only that, but they have not been testing beef which is imported, which, by law, they are required to do. This directly affects the British public, as about 40% of the beef British people eat comes from abroad, supposedly from countries like Brazil, which does not allow the use of growth hormones. Brazilian beef is stocked by some British supermarkets and widely used in catering. Yet, when a Brazilian farm was recently visited by EU inspectors, a large stockpile of this banned substance was found. This is not the first food scandal we have had in our country. Take the present concern over a well-known chocolate company. Several months ago, the company found out that its sweets were contaminated with a rare form of salmonella, but they did nothing about it, leaving their sweets in the shops to be bought by the unsuspecting public. It was not until five months later, when several children had suffered food poisoning, that the chocolate bars were removed from the shelves. It makes you wonder how many other dangerous foods have been allowed onto our plates. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the conversation between Andrew and Samantha. Complete the summary by writing one suitable word in the numbered spaces. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Does your work bring you into contact with many overseas students, Samantha? Occasionally. As you know, a solicitor's work is to advise people about their rights when they have any problems understanding how the law operates. They may need help because of injury to themselves or their property if they've been attacked or robbed, for example. But these are not by any means the main problems I deal with. Really? We know more about crime, I suppose, because we read about it in the newspaper or see it on TV. What other things do people come to you for help with? There are lots of things which don't get nearly so much attention. Sometimes it's to do with relationships in the community as when bills aren't paid, or contracted work isn't completed, or neighbours disagree. At other times, it's to do with people not understanding the law and their responsibilities, and this is probably where overseas students have the most difficulty. One interesting example is customs laws, something which every new arrival has to come up against. What is it that overseas students find most difficult to understand about Australian customs regulations? I think it's a shock to many people arriving here for the first time to find out how many things are prohibited. Everyday food items, for example. I mean, when I've been travelling overseas, I've been quite amazed at the lack of concern in some countries about food being brought in from other parts of the world without any check. You mean people arriving into other countries don't have to declare any foodstuffs at all? 
In some countries, there are lots of warnings about drugs and firearms, and there are usually limits on alcohol and tobacco, and perhaps perfume. But food's not mentioned. Yes, I suppose I never thought about it till I came here. You can take anything you like into England as far as food is concerned. You see, here you can't even drive from one state to another with a few apples and oranges for the journey. There are signs to remind you not to bring any fruit into some states, though they don't usually search your bags unless there's a fruit fly epidemic or something. <laughs> With those kinds of regulations between states, it's no wonder that they're so strict about what you can bring in from overseas. Of course, farmers would be wiped out if some pests were introduced which destroyed their whole crop. It's easy to understand why you should take steps to prevent that. And with food being such an important part of many cultures, it can be difficult for some people to realize they're not allowed to bring in delicacies from home for friends and relatives here. I'm defending someone at the moment who has exactly that problem. Oh,、uh, what happened? It's an interesting case. Have you got time for a cup of coffee? I'll tell you about it if you like. That'd be great. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.